So uh, this week, I, I mean, I always call my mom, and I call my mom, and my mother is one of these types who's always kind of positive and happy, and I was kind of surprised because um, I called her and she said that um, the previous day she was really depressed, and she's depressed because, you know, the state of the world, and you have Korea, and uh, all this sexual harassment, and the world seems to be falling apart, and so being that I like to argue, I... Um, I said, I don't, I don't think that's really true. And I said, We're, I said, do you remember the doctor in Missoula, Montana? She was a nurse. And there's this doctor who used to sexually harass the nurses. And basically, you had to put up with it. And even the good doctors who didn't like him, you just turned a blind eye because this guy had power. And I said, think about this. Think how the world has changed. Now, if a doctor did that to a nurse, she could sue that hospital, no matter how powerful that doctor is. None of the other doctors would keep silent about it. And my point being is that, you know, the world is changing. And there's this whole TED Talk I like, that the world is getting better. We have better medical attention. Um, uh, people don't die as much. Poverty is actually uh, decreasing throughout the world. The world is getting better. We're just now wrestling with these problems. And so I just kind of argued with her, and she agreed, because, you know, I'm always right. Um, <laughs> but the truth is, um, I logically could give an answer to her, but the truth is, I was actually incredibly depressed <laughs> that day. I really was. Um, I was depressed, and I was really calling her to lift me up. But um, the truth is, uh, logic doesn't make me any more hopeful. I mean, I can argue, but... I really, I was depressed. And what I was depressed about is that um, somebody sent an anonymous letter complaining, really, uh, about one of our parishioners and uh, things going on in their personal life and what am I going to do about this person. And it didn't really make me angry. It made me depressed because, you know, you kind of think, gosh, you know, I spent 26 of my years of my life in the priesthood um, trying to stop ridiculous things where people stick their nose into other people's pains and problems and then write anonymous letters as if they're religiously superior to somebody else. And to be honest, I don't think it was, the anonymous letter wasn't from, I don't think, one of our parishioners. I think it was actually, I'm pretty sure, it was somebody from St. Mark's writing about, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, but, no. But still, I was so depressed because I was like, this is what I'm wasting my life on? You know, like, it makes no difference. And I was really depressed. And that day, um, I actually, like, evenings are my busiest time. And I had, I got home early. I was home at uh, 7.15. So I kind of like, you know, I'm just going to spend some quality time with my best friend, the TV. Um, and I started watching and 7.45 in the evening, I was exhausted. So, this sounds embarrassing. I went to bed. Like, <laughs> I went to bed at 7.45 and I slept nine hours. And when I woke up, this is the amazing part, I woke up and I was incredibly joyful and hopeful about the world. That's all the sleep did to me. And the reason why is that I didn't receive any logical answers. And this, I have to tell you this part you're going to say, oh my God, he's crazy. Really, you should have figured that out a long time ago. Um, so I had these dreams, and I don't really remember what the dreams are about, you know how that is, but I dreamed about the color orange and a fire. And what that means to me is this. Um, when I was a little kid, um, I used to have dreams of God, and God would speak to me, but God would appear in the color orange that would just light up the sky. And so, one of my dreams was about orange, and God was speaking to me. I don't even remember what it was, but I know orange showed up, and God was speaking to me, and I, I felt good. The other dream was about fire, and what's fire? Um, fire, like John the Baptist speaks about fire, Elijah speaks about fire. Uh, the idea of the fire is that, um, you know, or... St. Paul speaks about fire, like St. Paul, when he talks about fire, um, that the love of God is like fire, and it will burn away all the fake. 
you know, the straw and the mud of the construction of our lives, the junk, God will burn it all away and the only thing that will remain, if you have a good foundation, that will survive. But all the silliness, the mud and the straw, all that will burn away. Um, that's kind of our idea of purgatory. You know, the useless, the trash, it'll all be burned away. And if we have a good foundation of our lives, everything else will stay. And I, I like that idea that the silly in time will all be burned away. And the anonymous letter is just part of the silliness. So I woke up incredibly joyful. And <clears throat> not joyful, I shouldn't say joyful, hopeful. That yeah, you know, you have these problems, but in the end, I think they'll all be burned away. And I just mentioned that because that idea of hope is what the readings are about. Even when uh, John the Baptist um, is, um, calls people to the desert, why the desert? Why do we go to the desert? Um, what the desert is, is this, and this gets a little technical. The last book of the Bible is the prophet Malachi. And Malachi speaks about the corruption in the government, the corruption in the priesthood. And God says, I'm just going to have to come and take care of this myself. And it's the last book of the Bible, and the last bit is saying, before the Messiah comes, God will send a prophet in the desert, crying out in the desert. So the reading today, uh, it was actually from the prophet Malachi. And I know that sounds confusing, because if you read what the deacon read, it says, a reading from the Gospel of Mark, the intro to the introduction to the Gospel of Mark, um, as written by the prophet Isaiah. And then the prophet Malachi is quoted. So the idea is that the Bible ends with this prophecy from Malachi about the desert, and the Gospel of John picks up with John the Baptist crying out into the desert. And you're, if you're wondering, why, why does it say the prophet Isaiah but quotes Malachi? The reason why is the Gospel of Mark, and I know I'm getting too technical, just fall asleep. Um, the Gospel of Mark is the first written, and it's very basic. It's more like cliff notes. And there's no capitals or punctuations, so you don't know. You have to know, you have to know the story to read the story. And um, it's not saying in the words of the prophet Isaiah, and then the quote, it's the Gospel of Mark in the words of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is the favorite prophet in that gospel. Does that make sense? And then it quotes Malachi because the Bible just ended with Malachi. And John the Baptist is the one crying out into the desert. Okay, so why the desert? Because remember, no, it's not that God is against religion, but religion is corrupt. The government is corrupt. If God is going to appear, don't go to Jerusalem. I know that sounds strange, but if God was going to appear, why wouldn't you go to the temple? You know, not, the temple has its corruption. It has to start with the people who aren't looking for the same old structures, the same old problems, and we're just going to add more of the Messiah to them. It's got to start with the people who want to go out. The desert is not a place. It's a place where there's no structures, where you can completely begin again. People who don't hope that the government or the church or medical attention, that that's going to be our great hope. That's not hope. If, you're, if your hope is in, well, medicine will make a great discovery, that's not really hope. That's just trusting more the structures that are already broken. The desert is a place where everything starts over again. So the people who go into the desert, those are the people who, they're tired of the same bigotries and prejudice and corruption that's just become part of the system. Does that make sense? It's not really rejection. It's about people who want to start again. And like John the Baptist, he's the perfect image of this. I mean, he's a wild man. He doesn't fit into the status quo. He wears camel hair and eats bugs. Um, and he's this image of hope because his hope is not in the status quo. It's in God. Does that make sense? I just doesn't want to trust more of the structure. Elijah's like that. John the Baptist is like that. Um, Isaiah is like that. That's how we're supposed to be. Our hope is not really that the government will take care of everything or the church. 
It's that somehow God will come and create this whole new, whole new world where it says the mountains will be torn down and the valleys filled up. The idea of that is that it's not going to be the same. The whole panorama of the horizon will change. Our, the way we see the world is going to completely change. Or in the first reading that Colin did, you did a great job, Colin. Way to go. Um, so. The second reading, where it speaks about a new heavens and new earth, you know, it'll be a, a different theology and a different way of seeing the world. Those are the people of hope that aren't trusting that the same old structures will answer all the questions. It's really people who are completely open to a new. Um, yes, there's corruption, but we're not going to double down on that. And like. Um, so hope begins with really this pathos for justice and a new beginning, not with trusting the same old structures. And so this sounds strange. The dream that I had, it gave me hope because, yeah, there's corruption in the church. You work with parishioners and they still want to stick their nose into other people's pains and problems. You know, the system in some sense is broke, but don't worry. God is coming. God will change it. The people who are open to change, they're the ones of hope. And it reminds me, John the Baptist reminds me of this priest, uh, Pierre Deschardins, if you know who he is. I spoke about him, but if you haven't fallen asleep, I love Pierre Deschardins. A little bit of his story. He was this Jesuit priest in France uh, around the time of World War, well, before World War I. And he was absolutely brilliant. Um, he was this priest, but also a scientist. And he was writing about evolution. And at the time, the Vatican didn't like that talk. And so they basically silenced him. And the Vatican pressured the Jesuits to move him out of France into the farthest cor corner of the world. And so this is a man, this is a priest who had to deal with the corruption of really the church. And they they transfer him clear over to China, to this place called Dragonbone Hill. And Pierre de, Chardin, Pierre de Chardin, he goes to this place, and he hears the people talking about the dragon bones that are in the hills. So he has to go check that out. And you know what they turn out to be? Dinosaur bones. <laughs> and he, he uh, helps discover what's called Peking Man at the time. So... They send him to the one place in the world that actually bolsters his idea of evolution. I just think it's kind of funny. And he's trapped there, but he makes all these discoveries. And then, not only is he a priest and a scientist, but then later in life he becomes this great mystic. And part of his mystical vision is what's called the Omega Point. And I just like that. That God is the Alpha and Omega. And that his idea is that, well, what God is doing is bringing us to the omega point. And the omega point is God starts with people just united with their families. And then he gets people united together in tribes and countries. And he said, over time, what God is doing is uniting humanity more and more with each other. That we're becoming more united together. Um, we're caring more about uh, bigger and bigger issues. And the omega point is when we're Human, all humanity is completely united together as one and with God, which to me is heaven. But his vision is that, no, God is slowly breaking down the old structures and replacing them with a whole new way of living. To me, that's hope. The vision that he had of God leading us to the omega point, only somebody like with the spirituality of John the Baptist or Elijah or Isaiah those are the ones who want the old really to pass away and welcome a new heaven and new, new earth where we're completely united together. To me, that's hope. Hope is not having the answer to every pro logical problem. If your source of hope is having an answer, a logical answer, that's not hope. That's logic. You know, you need to have a dream of the color orange. The old structure and the old prejudices, they're slowly being burned away. That's our hope. 
And why, you know, we light the second candle, and the second candle symbolizes hope, that we in the darkest time of the year, we are a people of hope. Our hope is not in the old structures, but in the Messiah. And if Christmas time, we're going to welcome the fact that we can see the presence of Christ being born among us, we first have to have the eyes of Pierre de Chardin or John the Baptist. We have to be the people in the desert who are completely open to the new. And so I hope we do become a people of hope. So please stand.